If you break a bone, you'll probably end up in a room just like this one. It's an emergency room. This is where you'll come to be given a plaster cast or perhaps an air cast while your bone heals. Hi, my name is Jonathan Bowen of PEMFTECH representing Curatronic and I'd like to talk to you today about bones and how they heal. The bones are the biological frame for the body, but they're much more than that. They give the mechanical support, but they also provide protection for those vital organs. They're also the body's blood factory, the body's factory that produces billions of cells. They are the body's storehouses for mineral building blocks that are necessary for bone production like calcium and phosphate. Well, the bone is constructed of an outer thin layer called the uh, periosteum. This is where the blood supply comes to the bone. It's also where the muscles attach. Below this layer is the cortex. Now it's a smaller ma layer made up of many compact layers that give the bone its strength. Inside this, there is an area that looks very porous and it's called spongy bone. And it looks like netting and it works like a, a truss in a house, in a roof perhaps, that would give maximum strength to the structure. It's usually found at the end of the bones. At the center of the bone is the medullary cavity. Now this contains the marrow, the body's blood factory that produces those 500 billion cells per day. But when a fracture occurs, the bone is naturally immobilized by blood, clotting and causing a hematoma. The bone fragments and the ends of the bone usually die because of lack of oxygen. And then little cells called fibroblasts move into the clotting area, turning the hematoma into granular tissue, creating a fibrin mesh network. And once this area is secured, the process of bone rebuilding can begin. It's the periosteum that rebuilds the bone. That's that outer layer that contains the minerals and the proteins in what's called the extracellular matrix. These are combined with collagen in a process called synthesis. Well, the inner layer contains the progenitor cells, which develop into fibroblasts. Progenitor cells usually lie dormant and they operate very slowly to replace cells that die through natural attrition but during injury they're mobilized towards the damaged area. The whole process is similar to a microscopic rotary paving system. Osteoclasts, and the word comes from two words meaning osteo, the bone, and clasts or the breakers. These are the bone breakers and they're very similar to a road milling machine that can turn up and strip weakened asphalt so it can be replaced. On the other side there's the osteoblasts. These are the bone builders. Osteo meaning bone and blast basically meaning to build. So they rebuild the bone. They're similar to the asphalt laying machines that lay down that new layer of bone material. With these work the osteocytes. These are bone cells forming the osteons or the units of compact bone. And this whole process is called ossification or osteogenesis, the idea of the genesis of the bone. So what do electromagnetic forces have to do with all this? Well, the bone generates bioelectrical messages to trigger bone development. When force is applied to the bone, it generates piezoelectrical signals that trigger the periosteum to put in process a thickening of the bone. Piezo comes from two Greek words meaning epi, which is upon, and the idea of putting something upon, shortened to the word p, and sed meaning to apply pressure. So putting them together you have piezo, or to apply pressure upon something. The more stress is placed upon a bone, the more the bone will increase in density over time. Piezoelectricity is a commonplace phenomenon. We see it all the time when pressure is applied to quartz crystals, deforming them, creating an electronic current and a spark, which is used in stoves or in cigarette lighters to ignite fuel. This is also the reason why astronauts lose bone density in space. There is no gravity or force triggering the piezoelectrical currents in the bone, so the bone steadily decreases in density. It's a common a condition that's called osteopenia, meaning bone poverty or bone mineral density loss. Interestingly, it's observed much more in athletes who participate in non-load-bearing sports such as swimming or cycling rather than running where these piezoelectrical currents are constantly being triggered. 
The same result can happen due to a lack of movement or exercise during injury perhaps or sickness or aging or even just a sedentary lifestyle. Osteopenia will eventually turn into osteoporosis as bone density drop becomes at a, to a chronic level. The problem can be intensified due to a lack of proper nutrition, eating disorders, could be smoking or consuming too much alcohol, but also deficiencies in vitamin D, vitamin K, calcium and magnesium will contribute to these factors. If a bone is underutilized, it slowly degenerates, thins out and becomes brittle. One of the main causes in the death of bones is a lack of oxygen, which occurs when there's too much rest or immobilization or lack of use. This is why walking combined with a healthy diet and right minerals being absorbed will stimulate the bone to increase in density by the piezoelectrical currents created during the whole process. Well, PEMF can be used to stimulate bioelectrical signals. For a long time, medicine hasn't really attempted to treat fractures or to influence the rate of healing. Rather, it has tried to just recognize the condition, stabilize it, and then rehabilitate. Research into PEMF has changed this approach. Lots of study has been done to demonstrate the success of PEMF in stimulating bone healing. Consider some of the studies that have taken place. In 2015, the stem cell research study concluded that the use of PEMF to stimulate osteogenesis is based on the idea of stimulating the natural endogenous streaming potentials in the bone and can be used to regenerate tissue as well as differentiate bone marrow stromal cells into osteoblasts or the bone builders. In other words, PEMF can be used to stimulate bone repair, the same way those piezoelectrical forces do. They help the bone factory release the necessary minerals for osteogenesis or bone creation. One of the problems facing doctors is non-union fractures. These are fractures where the bones don't properly come together and do not heal. In fact, about 5-10% to of fractures will result in delayed or non-unions. There are several reasons for this, but a major issue is poor blood supply during the healing process. According to physiotherapist Brian Simpson, infections are also a significant cause of the problem. Fractures, he says, often result in bones piercing skin and even clothing, sometimes embedding in soil or even fragments being uh, lost on the roadside of the racetrack. Such pollution of the bone ends often results in infection and non-union or fractures when the bones don't come together and heal properly. He goes on to explain that infection may be introduced surgically as well as the result resulting again in non-unions. Well this is where PEMF really shines. The fact that bone regeneration is stimulated by piezoelectrical currents has led researchers to investigate the use of PEMF in healing fractures. After the fracture, it's difficult to stress a bone and incur the piezoelectrical current. Therefore, pulsed electromagnetic fields have been found to be an effective alternative, simulating currents that run down the length of the bone and provide that stress. How effective is PMF in treating fractures? Well, consider the result of some of the studies. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons in September 2003 stated, pulsed electromagnetic fields may be as effective as surgery in managing extremity non-unions. Looking at a double-blind trial of delayed union fractures managed by plaster casts with active PEMF, they found that 45% in the active group healed, compared to only 12% in the control group. The conclusion? Well, PEMF treatment is recommended as an adjunct to standard fracture management. There was the Bassett study examining 127 tibia bone fractures. So these are non-union fractures that were treated with PMFs and it yielded an overall success rate of 87%. A second Bassett report a year later looked at 83 non-unions with wide fracture gaps and other issues. Well, these patients achieved an 87% success rate. There's also the Gosling study, comparing cases healed with PMF versus surgery. The result was 81% of the reported cases healed with PMF versus 82% with surgery. When studying 
infected non-unions, 81% were healed with PMF, compared with only 69% with surgery. And when studying closed injuries, 85% were healed with PMF, compared to only 79% with surgery. Conclusion? Well, PEMF is equally effective in treating non-unions as surgery is, and perhaps more effective when treating non-unions that have infections or are part of closed injuries. In a 2012 study in the Journal of Orthopedic Surgery, researchers demonstrated a healing rate of 77.3%. The study included x-rays showing the progress before and after PMF was introduced. The first two x-rays in the study show the non-unions 10 months after the fracture. These are pictures A and B. And you can see that, well, they haven't healed very well. The second two x-rays show the result of PMF stimulation on fracture sites leading to fracture union five months after the first x-rays. These are pictures C and D and you can see the healing that is taking place. The same study included other x-rays. The first two x-rays, A and B, show the initial fractures. The second two x-rays, C and D, are six months after surgery, showing healing is being delayed. Well, the third set, E and F, are seven months after, introducing PMF into the, the course of treatment. And they finally show formation of bridging callus in three out of the four cortexes. There's also the Mooney study, looking at lumbar fusions following surgery. And they found that an active group, there was a 92% success rate. There's Dr. Richard Marx's 2000 study, an examination of lumbar fusions following surgery as well. He found that fusions succeeded in 97.6% of the PEMF patient group, while only 52.6% of the unstimulated group had successful fusions. Curatron has distinguished itself as a leader in PEMF technology operating at safe frequencies between the 2 and 50 Hz, which is similar to the Earth's own magnetic resonance. It operates at frequencies found to stimulate the osteoblasts and the bone matrix, based on research conducted by different hospitals, universities uh, throughout the world. It uses a sinusoidal wave, which is the most purest form of wave that there is, and it serves as the building block for all other periodic waveforms. It also alternates frequencies to ensure that the cells are constantly stimulated because cells have memory and we don't want the cells to learn the frequency and become simply unaffected by it. Like professional lawn cutters, they always cut the grass in two directions. If it's always cut in one direction, the grass will learn and it will simply lay down so the cutting is not effective. So the professional cutters that cut at golf courses will cut in bi-directions. Well, the same is true with PEMF. A continually changing frequency will continue to stimulate the cell so the effect is never lost. Curatron also has the power necessary to penetrate the bone. In a study on PMF and fracture healing, physiotherapist Brian Simpson related that the clinical applications of PEMF needed the strength of a pulse to approach the 1,000 Gauss range or the 100,000 microtesla in order to be effective. He also stated that studies quoted in the section of the article are regarded as uh, are regarding pulsed magnetic fields and not static magnets. So it requires both a strong pulse and an alternating pulse, not a static pulse. So Curatron devices recommended for bone healing operate between 70,000 and 160,000 microteslas, capable of penetrating the bone, penetrating the skull, any area that needs to have stimulation for osteoblasts. Curatron has a proven track record as well. It stimulates the oxygenation and eliminates the rouleau effect in the blood. This is hugely important because bones are often an area that have a tough time getting blood to them. So when as much blood can get to them as possible, it brings the necessary minerals and nutrients and delivers them to the healing mechanisms. At the same time, toxins and waste products of the healing process are then removed, speeding up the process altogether. Plus, Curatron has a multitude of other applications that we haven't even talked about in this short video. 
So contact us today and find out how you or your patient can take the fast lane to recovery. For the full and documented studies, read the article below the video and you'll have all the annotations there. Thank you very much for joining us with PEMF Technologies and Curatronic.